Well, hi, church. Thank you for tuning in. Today we're in the end of Mark chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 23, and this is uh, another kind of question and answer time with Jesus, where Pharisees come to him with a question. This one is about the Sabbath. We've seen a few of these kind of all stacked in a row in the book of Mark. Uh, They're asking him uh, at the beginning of chapter 2, he forgives a paralyzed man's sins, and they're like, how can he forgive sins? Okay. They're thinking it in their minds and their hearts. Jesus answers them. He says, I can forgive sins if I want to because I'm the son of God, and I can also heal him and raise him to walk again, and um, go and do it, and it happens, okay? And then the next thing, he goes to the Levi, Matthew, uh, the, the new disciple, goes to his house and eats with them, and they say, why are you eating with tax collectors and sinners? Uh, he says, the sick need a doctor. And then he goes um, to, uh, they, they, they ask him about fasting. We looked at it yesterday. Uh, why aren't you fasting? And he says, because I'm the bridegroom and we're at a wedding and I'm here with my people and um, we'll fast later. And now today they're going to ask him about the Sabbath. They have all these questions they want to know about. Um, And I'll read it to you. It says, one Sabbath he was walking through the grain fields. And as they made their way, the disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for anybody but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. And he said, The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. All right. And it's going to go on from there, and, and we'll look into chapter 3 tomorrow, but it's the same series of stacked up stories of Jesus doing something and a bunch of people asking him questions about it. And the questions get more and more pointed as it goes. Remember, the paralyzed man, they're, they're thinking the questions. Um, and he says, why do you question these things in your hearts? Okay. Uh, then he's eating with tax collectors. Why are you eating with tax collectors? Now they're asking him directly, and he answers them. Okay. Um, next, it's why don't you fast? Why aren't you following these prescribed things, these religious things that we do? Why aren't you doing them? And now they're, they're getting a little bit even more pointed. It's unlawful to be plucking grains of heads of grain on the Sabbath. You're, you got, your disciples are breaking the law. It's not just you're associating with some bad people. It's not just that you're breaking certain customs about fasting. Now you're breaking the law, they say. Okay. So their, their, point, their questions are, are narrowing down. They're getting more and more pointed as this, as this chapter 2 of Mark goes on. And we'll see by the time we get to chapter 3, um, they have another question about uh, the Sabbath because he heals a guy. And at the end of it, it says they, they're going to plot to destroy him. Okay, So the, this is the, this, this progression in the book of Mark of, of Jesus entering the scene. And it's, it's exciting and it's great. But now there's this series of questions coming after him. Uh, that, that are going to get more and more pointed, and by the beginning of chapter 3, they're ready to destroy him. And this is Mark's march. The Gospel of Mark is marching up to the crucifixion. He is in a hurry to get there. Everything in Mark, I've said this a few times, happens immediately. They do this. Immediately they do that. And, and he tells these short little stories for a paragraph or two and then moves to the next story and the next story. But they oftentimes are linked together in that way. And you see it here. These guys... Start with some innocent questions in their hearts, but before long, they are ready to destroy him with their hands, and they're talking out loud and everything else, okay? So you see that happening here. Um, you, re- you remember, I, I think we discussed this back in chapter 1 with John the Baptist. Jesus says the time is fulfilled. He sees John the Baptist goes to jail, and, he, and, he, and when he sees that, he says, now the time is fulfilled. He was waiting for a particular time. The people who didn't respond to John the Baptist, the people who were against John the Baptist, are going to be against Jesus. John fulfilled his purpose. He, he, he lived out. He, he did what God called him to do. He reached that point, and, and God said, your ministry is done now. You're going to be in jail, and now my son Jesus is going to step on the scene, and Jesus recognized that and did it. Um, you have a time to repent. You have a period of time of warning. John the Baptist is the voice crying in the wilderness, repent, prepare the way. Get ready. Be ready. But you don't say get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. You eventually say get ready, go. Get ready, get set, go, right? That's what you say at the beginning of a race or something. John's telling them to get ready. If they are not ready by then, 
then they're not there. If they reject John, they're going to reject Jesus. And so you see these guys, they're listening to Jesus. They're watching him, they're following him around, but nope. In the end of the day, their hearts are going to harden up and they're going to turn against him. Okay. But think specifically about this. Let's look at this. Mark two, verse 23 through 28. Um, he, they're asking him, he's walking around, they're plucking heads of grain on the Sabbath day. And that, that was considered harvesting. And Sabbath is a day off. It's a day of rest. It's remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. On that day, you shall do no work, right? No work. Well, walking down the road and plucking some heads of grain on the side of the road and, and eating them on the way was determined by various people to be considered a work. Okay, they had particular rules about how many steps you're allowed to walk, how far you're allowed to go on the Sabbath. Do you remember a few times uh, it, it says, oh, they're about a Sabbath day's journey from Jerusalem, right? It's where um, a small town of Bethany was. A Sabbath day's journey was a unit of measurement. You're allowed to walk this far and no farther on the Sabbath day. These guys are walking down the road doesn't say how far they went. Maybe they were staying within the confines of, of the Sabbath day's journey. But look, the Old Testament has tons of laws, tons of them about the Sabbath. I mean, absolutely, uh, the Sabbath is extremely important in Scripture. It, it's, it's commented on all through. You read, read your, your books of the law, your Genesis through Deuteronomy. The Sabbath is one of the most frequently discussed principles in the Old Testament. The Sabbath is, is the book of Jeremiah is about the Sabbath in large part. The whole reason the people of Israel were captured by Babylon and, and in exile for 70 years was to fulfill 70 years of Sabbaths that they had not obeyed for 490 years. Every seven years is a Sabbath year divided by seven. It's a 70 year exile. Jeremiah spelled all this out. He told them, he warned them. He said, look, this is how it's going to work. The Sabbath is so important. Okay. Um, but it didn't give laws for how many steps you're allowed to take and how far you're allowed to walk. It said you shall do no work, you should keep it holy. Okay. It didn't say you're not allowed to pluck a head of grain as you walk down the road. It didn't say that. These, these were laws that were invented by well-intentioned people who were doing their best to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy and do no work. They said, what exactly does that mean? Does that mean we never get out of bed? Does that mean we never eat or drink? Do we never go to the kitchen and, and pour a cup of water? What does it mean to do no work? We don't want to disobey God's Ten Commandments. We love the, we love the Lord. We want to obey Him. We, we love His law. We want to obey it fully. Remember, Israel believed that their only way they could be saved from the Romans or saved from the Babylonians or whatever other empire was coming against them was by their strict obedience to the Lord. They're, they're a nation built on God's law. So they want to obey God's law, and they want to obey it really well to make sure that they never get carried off by the Babylonians again or whatever other empire. They learned a lot of lessons. Read Ezra and Nehemiah sometime. They learned a lot of their lessons from that. They, they never had a problem with idolatry, at least not, not spelled out like it had been previously in the Old Testament. All right? So these guys were well-intentioned. And they made these laws to protect the Sabbath. And Jesus' Jesus's disciples are out for a walk, and they're plucking heads of grain, and they're like, that's unlawful, Jesus. Why are you letting them do that? Why are you letting them? And Jesus tells them a short story. Didn't you know, David, um, you, you can go read, read about this. Um, I didn't look it up. I guess it's, in, um, it's probably in, in 1 Samuel. Um, anyway, uh, D David uh, briefly was on the run from Saul, and King Saul trying to kill him, and he hides out with priests, and, and he eats the bread of the presence, which is reserved only for priests. It's very clear in the law. And yet David is not condemned for it. He's not punished for it. He gives it to his men, um, and it's, it's, it's accepted. It, nothing bad comes from it. Okay, uh, So Jesus says, look, they, they, he, he's pointing out that, hey, there's exceptions to this. And he says, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Sabbath is made for man. That means it is there for your good. It is there to give you a day of rest. God himself took a day of rest. The land of rest, the, the, the promised land of Israel that they, they are going to out of Egypt in your book of Exodus, and they have the 40 years in the wilderness that the book of Numbers describes. It's often called the land of rest. 
there's this theme of Sabbath day's rest. The book of Hebrews picks it up a lot as well. And Jesus does right here. That God is going to bring you into the land of rest. Enter into God's rest. Okay? This is for your good. And so the Sabbath day, the Sabbath year, the Jubilee year, all these things, all of them are meant to point you and remind you that your identity is not in this world. That your work is not of this world. That you have valuable things, eternally valuable things that you cannot do in this world. And so take a day of rest and remember it and keep it holy because it belongs to the Lord. And that is made for your good as a reminder to you, as a solution, I, 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 not a solution, but as a, um, as, as a band-aid for the curse of Genesis 3 when God curses Adam and Eve's labor and their work and their pain and the futility and the sweat of your brow and the thorns and all this. You're working hard all the time, right? You, you, you have stuff to do. You have things to do. And he says, no, remember the Sabbath. Keep it holy. Set it apart. Don't engage in this futile labor that leads nowhere but pain and suffering. Take it off by faith. Keep it holy by faith and be reminded and look forward to the coming of the new kingdom when you will be in the presence of God and enter into his true rest. Okay, so that's a very quick overview, run through of, of a major theme of the Bible is the Sabbath and, and resting and stuff. Okay, um, he said, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Verse 28, so the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. And it doesn't say a whole lot about it here. It just moves into chapter 3. He entered, again, he entered the synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. It, it's, it's a Sabbath day. Um, and, and after that, they're ready to, to destroy him, it says. But look, he is saying the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Who is Lord of the Sabbath? God is Lord of the Sabbath. God invented the Sabbath. God rested on the seventh day. God blessed the Sabbath day. God made the Sabbath day holy. God set it apart. He put it in the Ten Commandments. It's core to God's law, and it's made for you and I for our good. We were not made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for us to give us a day off, a day of rest from our labors, a day of rest to be reminded that as hard as we can work, we'll never get it all done in this world because our hope isn't in this world because this world has fallen. Take a day off and rest. It's for your good. And now he says, I am Lord of that. That's a God claim. If, that's, you, that, if, if you say that, you're claiming to be God. Because God owns the Sabbath. He is Lord of the Sabbath. And Jesus says, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. He's talking about himself. I'm Lord of the Sabbath. So these guys have a, have a decision to make. They can listen to him and say, wow, he's making a really serious claim here. We should pay attention, or they could dismiss him and find ways to get rid of him. And, and you see this, these pointed questions coming more and more pointed at him. Now they're accusing him of breaking the law and everything else. He's like, I made the law. I know the law better than you. That law is, is not, not it. I'm, I'm, I'm king of it. I'm better than it. All right. They have a choice to make. They, they've seen him. Look, these guys are following him. Do you get that? They're following him. Um, he doesn't just walk around by himself or by himself and a couple disciples. There's other people around, okay? When he heals the paralyzed man, the house is crowded with people. And a bunch of them are sitting there thinking, the scribes are sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. There's scribes there. Scribes and Pharisees are often lumped together, okay? There, there's, there's these spiritual leaders of Israel there that know their stuff, that know their Bibles, and they're there. They're paying attention. They're listening. They're, they're trying to figure out. Maybe some of them are probably already looking for dirt on him because they already don't like him. Other ones might be legitimately curious about him. All right, it doesn't say, that. Why, why is he doing this? They're asking in their hearts. And Jesus says, you know, why do you question these things in your hearts? And he, he heals the man. He, picks, he gets up and walks away. So, so he's not just a guy making, making radical claims. He's a guy doing miracles. He's not, anybody can run around shouting all sorts of blasphemies and, and evil or weird or dumb stuff. Anybody can do that. This guy, Jesus, is, is, is making claims to be God and he's doing miracles, all right? He calls Levi and he associates with, with a tax collector. And the Pharisees say, why are you doing that? He says, well, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of me like a doctor and, and sick people need a doctor, right? 
they don't argue with him. They just, okay, that's that's an answer. I, I guess that could be reasonable. Um, they question him about fasting, and now he says there's a new wineskin, there's a new cloth. All right, he's making a claim again to be somebody unique. And now in the Sabbath, he's he's doing this, and he has a biblical precedent. He points back at David. So they're listening, they're paying attention. Now, the question for you is how do you apply this? Are you paying attention to Jesus? Are you, are you asking pointed questions to figure out who he is? Is he worth following to you? And where is your heart going with this? I feel like there, there's, there's a lot of different responses you can have to Jesus. You can, you can listen to him and then go your way and think, well, that was interesting. I learned another Bible story today. Bible stories are neat. Learned a neat moral lesson about it. That was cool. And, and it's just kind of, they, they, a lot of people call Jesus teacher, neat teacher. He doesn't teach like everybody else. He teaches some really neat stuff, okay? Um, that, that's one response that people have to Jesus. Another one is, is this skepticism that, that comes from someplace within you that says, I don't like this guy. I'm going to find some dirt on him. I, no matter what happens, I'm going to ask, I'm going to nitpick it. I'm going to ask some questions. I, I don't, there's something I don't like here. And you're going to nitpick it and nitpick it and nitpick it, and you're going to find issues. They found issues with Jesus. Um, you're going to accuse him. You're going to say, nope, nope, that's not for me. And sooner or later, you're going to reach a point where you have to make a total decision to either reject him or to bend the knee and bow to him. And that's the other option is you can, can listen to him, get curious about him, ask some questions, and say, wow, this is the Son of God. You own my life, and you give your life to him. Those are three options. The first one is where a lot of people want to sit. They don't want to reach the decision. They don't want to give Jesus their whole life. They want to live their life the way they want to live their life. They also don't want to reject him and say no to him and, 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 and be part of that angry mob. They, nobody wants to do that, right? I don't, I don't want to be a, some angry person. I just I think he's neat. And people like to leave Jesus there. Maybe they'll go to church. Maybe they'll go to Bible study. Maybe they'll, they'll, Jesus is a neat guy. Neat religion, cool parables. Oh, this aren't the miracles neat? I don't know if I believe all the miracles, but man, that's interesting stuff. And people want to leave him like that. But Jesus doesn't allow that. The stuff he does, the stuff he says is intentional. And he's trying to wake you up and say, listen, I forgive sins. I heal paralyzed people. I fulfill the requirements of the Old Testament law. I'm not just an interesting guy. That's what Jesus is, is everything he does. I'm not just an interesting guy. He wants, he's forcing a decision from you. And you can hold off and, and, and choose not to make a decision and choose to just find him a little bit interesting. Um, but sooner or later, that becomes its own choice. And ultimately, that is a rejection of him as God. If you're accepting him as a teacher. You're accepting him as a neat guy. You're accepting him as this and that. But if you're not accepting him as God, you're rejecting him. Because God is God. And, and he's not just interesting. He's not just worthy of some cool stories that you learned about and educating you and making you a little bit more knowledgeable. He's God. And if you reduce him to an interesting story, then you're rejecting him. You're part of the crowd that didn't really follow him. You're, you're, you're not really a disciple. You just find him neat. He's, he's a celebrity or something. You need to repent of that. And give your life to Jesus because that, as much as you're trying to avoid ever making a final decision, as much as you're trying to avoid giving your whole life to him, that would be radical. Or you don't want, I don't want to reject him outright. That would be radical. I want to stay middle of the road. The middle road, that wide road, many travel it, it leads to destruction. Jesus is not just an interesting guy. He is not a celebrity. He is here for your heart, soul, mind, and strength for eternity. He is here for everything. And if you choose to only give him a little bit of your interest, that's actually a rejection. You've already made a decision, and it's the wrong one. All right, let's humble ourselves. Let's give him everything. Praise the Lord. Let me pray for you. Lord Jesus, we, we humble ourselves before you. We confess that we often don't want to make a radical decision. We often want to follow you a little bit, ask some questions, learn some neat stuff, and go home. Lord, forgive us for that. You are God. We confess that you are God, and we want to stand on that rock. Lord, be glorified in our lives that we would follow you in everything, radically in your direction. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord, church. God bless you.
Uh, we'll get, dig into chapter three tomorrow.